Tez live. again so happy to be back <laughs> really interested in our topic today and our special guest Dr. Baba Wade oh my gosh we really need to delve into this because we are in trouble deep so much is happening to our loved ones and our family and we're caught up in the savagery of white supremacy as some would say so Absolutely. how do we heal how do we get out of this morass? How do we elevate and get back to health and sustainable well-being? So we're here trying to uh, have a really good conversation about creating Zola, which is love, that energy that we know just thrives and vibes throughout the cosmos. And indeed, it will ignite in Gola, which is the healing energy that we also desperately need. So we're excited to be here today. I'm Linda James Myers and I am your moderator. And I am a past president of ABCI as well as a uh, elder of Elders Emeriti. So I'll let the rest of our team introduce themselves. Baba Wade, do you wanna go next? Yes, I'm Bob, Baba Wade Nobles. I'm a, one of the co-founders of ABCI and past president and um, and, uh, and a writer about things in black psychology. I'm Jojo Hickson. I'm a member of DCABSI and also the social media impact team. I'm also a 30 year clinical society student with a clinical interest in racial trauma. My name is Gag Bollier. I'm a fourth year clinical society candidate. Um, I'm done with all my classes today. It's lit. Uh, <laughs> I am uh, the vice chair of the DCAB side, member of the social media impact team uh, and the Eastern graduate representative of the student circle. Hey everyone, I'm Robina. I am a PhD candidate in counseling psychology. I'm also on the social media virtual impact team and the communications chair for the um, student circle of AB Psy. And um, just to plug here, we have a book club that we're restarting up. We had our first one last year and had four amazing um, books that we, well, actually five, because Nana Linda, we had it, um, a book that she has written, Our Health Matters. And so we're going to be starting that back up in May. So look out for the um, flyers. Please look out for that. And I'm Evan August. I'm the student circle chair, the South Bona Healing Circle co-chair, uh, candidate in clinical psychology, specializing in forensics. And another plug, uh, we are we have our next South Bona Healing Circle training tomorrow evening. Our flyer is pending, but if you're interested, uh, pay attention to the social media. The flyer will be going out, the registration will be going out, and we'll be doing two additional circles for anybody seeking to cope with the trial and the trauma that's going on right now. So also be on the lookout on our social media because that information will be pending as well. Thank, thank you so very much. We have our crew here today to talk about seeing the cosmos through the eyes of our ancestors. So today our focus is gonna be renewing the African mind with ancestral consciousness. And I'm so excited because um, it's that consciousness that is our salvation. 
and without it, we will not survive, much less thrive. But with it, we got this. And so I was very pleased to um, I have Baba Wade share with us an article, I guess you must have published in 2020, where he talks about the reality that I've been pushing for so long in optimal psychology, which is our ultimate purpose in being is to come to realize conscious union with the divine. Oh, we <laughs> now I know that's a long way out for most people, but I think if we know at least that's where we got to go, we can at least get on the right path to get there. It's going to be a challenge for some, but it's going to be also something that many of us already know instinctively, intuitively. And so uh, this afternoon, that's what we want to talk about. Baba Wade, let's begin with you. Can I do the screen share again? Because I think what I want to do is to quickly show some thoughts on, on paper and then we can have an open conversation. But I, I do have some things I want to carry us through. I think we do, I would like to share what I think has happened to us and then what is this, technically what is ancestral consciousness and then how do we renew the mind? So if I can share the screen, I can go through those hopefully quickly and then we can have a, a conversation. Sure, and particularly if we focus on the latter two issues, because we spend a lot of time talking about the problem. So if we can focus on the solution, we'll love that. Well, you you, you control me, uh, Linda, because sometimes I get stuck. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to um, I, I want to quickly point out that, and I keep saying this, we are the ancestors, and we have come to complete what was incomplete. If we can think, keep that in our minds, we have come to complete what was incomplete. And so a lot of our work is, should be geared towards that. And I, we went through this last time, but I wanna go quickly to uh, this notion here of the renewing of the African mind and seeing with ancestral eyes. And last time we talked about narrative, language and voice. And those are three uh, areas I think are important because we don't, we don't use our own narrative which is how we describe and explain, recognize and record events and make sense out of reality, then we will continually uh, be in, engrossed in their narrative and making decisions and making choices and taking chances through their narrative. And that's been the problem. We've been trying to solve our problems with their solutions. And that's that's an error. And I always like to point out that, that languaging, language is important that borrowing and using alien language as the first tool of communication is Fukuyao says is one of the most dangerous steps chosen by our people. When we prioritize English as the language of communication, we carry the weight, and, I, and I, again, I wanna emphasize this, we carry the weight of Greco-Roman, Germanic, Anglo-Saxon, European culture and civilization. We use the very language, even because there's meaning behind language. So we say uh, family, if we don't unpack what family is from an African perspective, then our family becomes their structural thing of a, a man and a wife and 2.5 children, a dog named Spot, the cat named Puff, and a picket fence. So we get framed in their stuff. And then voice for me is, is essentially important because voice is the power to express one's essence. And we got to tap into what is this African essence, the power to express one's essence in the experience of living. Voice is what we use to capture our maps of meaning. It is what is grounded in our culture, in our historical relationships, in our meaning as a person. Uh, Jay Carruthers, I always uh, channel him, says, listen to the voice of the ancestors without European interpretation. Now, let me talk a bit, just quickly about what I see as ancestral consciousness. Ancestral consciousness is in effect, the construct that represents the ability of human beings to know, to perceive, to understand, and to be aware of themselves in relationship to self and all else. Consciousness is revealed in and determined by energy, energy, spirit in motion, in relationships. Consciousness is determined in relationships. Everything vibrates in a divinely governed universe. Ancestral consciousness is potentiality contained in itself. Resonate on that. Ancestral consciousness is potentiality contained in itself. As potentiality contained in itself, the entire multiverse 
is a never ending totality of possibilities. Think about how, what, what kind of reach we have with that, that the entire multiverse is a never ending totality of possibilities. And that's what consciousness is. Consciousness is the intelligent energy of the divine. Consciousness is more than potentiality contained in itself. It is knowing and knowable vibration, motion, energy, consciousness is simultaneously potentiality and intentionality contained in the pulse of life. Potentiality and intentionality contained in the pulse of life. There, I believe that consciousness, African consciousness, is the essence, the energy, the expression, the experience of spiritness, being spirit, not having spirituality, but being spirit is the energy, expression, and experience of spiritness in the form of awareness, knowing, comprehension, existing. It is both the substance, essence, and the state, condition of all that exists and does not exist. I have to ponder about that sometimes. Consciousness is is also all that does not exist. That seems like a crazy notion, but consciousness is all that does not exist. It is the capacity to absorb all life, life is energy, and information. Information is energy in form, energy in form. That's what information is. It is being aware, unaware, and beyond awareness all at the same time. That's how we roll. We, 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 we can make, see ourselves in this most, most profound way. The esoteric understanding of African consciousness, I'm sorry, ancestral consciousness, is the material, the physical, and the immaterial, the non-physical, reflection or expression of spirit in the vibratory evidence and energy of the divine all. And you can call that divine all. You can personalize that divine all if you want to. And you can call them by various names, but it is the all. And sometimes, we, we, depending upon whether you're Muslims, the Jews, or, or, or Christians, or Buddha, whatever, we give them personalized names, but what it is, is the all. It is the divine all. Ancestral consciousness is intricately merged with our spiritness, with our being. I want to pause and let you think about that. Ancestral consciousness is intricately merged with our spiritness. We are spirit energy. It is the knowing of what a knowing and knowable spirit knows. Consci the all is the knowing of what a knowing and knowable spirit knows. Ancestral consciousness is that which transcends thought and, and penetrates everything so as to make it being aware of itself. That's what Big Mom would do when she get a feeling. She didn't, have, she didn't have the thought and the language to be able to say this is what's going on, but she just had a feeling. And my big mom was something like rubber elbow. She rubber elbow and say, I don't know, it don't set right with me. All the kind of the, the old, old timey language, but it was really her being radiating an ancestral consciousness. It is that which allows African people to reflect, to respond, to project, to create from before and beyond this time. What's going on right now? is confusion because we are not tapping into. I mean, it's confusing, it's not confusing. We know these people are savage and they're doing savage stuff, but we don't know why we are not doing what we're doing in, in, in sort of the right way, because we have, in my opinion, have not tapped into the ability to reflect, to respond and to project a solution, to project a solution. Uh, and so I, let me speak quickly about this black identity because I think this is a problem for us because my work, I talk about fractured consciousness, fractured African consciousness, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry, shattered African consciousness and fractured black identity, shattered and fractured. Identity is how a being is recognized and locatable in time and space. That's a simple, that's a simple definition. It also includes the meaning of that being. Consistent with the Western grand narrative, black as a being has represent has been been hijacked and has been made to represent the opposite of white, and it connotes things like bad, wicked, evil, dangerous, ignorant, stupid, whatever is the opposite of the good or the the sublime. That's what blackness is. Black people became we, the curse of Ham. They, they they made us go into the Bible and it made us that it was God's choice to make us this evil thing. We're evil, bad, undeserving of respect and regard. Look at the way we're treated, comes right out of this black identity. 
black identity is designated by a group of people who have are highly melanated, look like us, it is a determinative for how black people are located in time and space along with the meaning of blackness. Yet someone else has taken the authority to find what our blackness means. And I think that's what's key, Baba Wade, your notion of languaging, it's indeed within our power yes. and requirement to define for ourselves what family is, what blackness is, and define it from the consciousness. Absolutely. Ancestral consciousness and the understanding that our ancestors had. And I think that is indeed our solution. And that's what we that's what I wanted to point out is that the problematic really is, is that we've allowed other people to, to have the power to find who we are and what we are. And then we act out their story. We act out their drama and we never find our wholeness, our wellness doing that. And so this is a, just quickly to show you all that uh, I've tried to talk about, this is just, this is a iconograph a, 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 a of all the things that come from us as African people, African Americans. We have these philosophical, even though it's untapped and unknown sometimes, it's in us, of the philosophical deep structure, wisdom mm -hmm. traditions of the Awe, the Wolof, the Congo, the Bantu, the Hausa, all these major, major streams of ancestral uh, uh, themes come into our mind map, or I'm calling it a mindscape. This is like my pic, my trying to pictureize a mindscape. And all these things, personal contribution, uh, peer creation, dependent relationship, right conduct, harmony of opposites, collective survival, complementary role performance, cultural themes, customs, all, all the stuff that I've been, I, we, we all have played with in, in ABCI over the years. I've tried to capture up and talk about the cultural laws, the cultural virtues, the cultural customs. These are things that, emerge out of our ancestral consciousness and they come from us. We don't just, we did not just drop out of the sky. We, we came from something, we have something. And then I want to show where it was shattered. Our mindscape, our mind map, I'm using the term metric infection, was imposed or infected with other ideations like selfishness, privilege, subjugation, arbitrary killing, nothingness, individuality, uh, denigration, all those things that make up the. Let me turn this off. Let me try to turn this off. I'm being, I'm being interrupted. Uh, well, I don't know how. Uh, so, so, so you can see the what this is a picture by trying to show a picture of our shattered conscience. We have all our African stuff that's intrinsic, and we have all this extrinsic stuff that's been imposed on us like these other ideas, docility, uh, racial hatred, racial hatred that gets turned in on ourselves, respect for only whiteness. These are ideations that are, I'm calling the evidence of our shattered consciousness and fractured mind. And so then, I'm, I, I, then I want to suggest as we move to solution is that I think we, uh, we have something called the suffering of the spirit or spirit damage. We don't, we don't, we don't have, now I, I can debate this another time, but I just want you to hear me through this. We don't have mental illness. We have spirit damage, and spirit damage is reflected in our shattered consciousness and fractured identity. I think it is represented as a worldwide mimetic conversion of the African mind. African conscious Black identity was shattered and fractured by the all pervasive domination of our ancestors' space, time, energy, mobility, bonding, and identity. That's what this enslavement, colonialization, colonialization and domination tried to achieve. And I say tried to achieve. They were never successful. If they were successful, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. We would not be making this analysis. And the shattered African consciousness as in black identity is evidence in three domains, the essence of being human, the expression of being human, and the experience of being human. I think the question of reparations, repairing our our damaged spirit, uh, it requires no less than a well-constructed, multi-level, multi-fractal campaign designed to systematically articulate what it means to be African. I can stop right there. What it means to be African, focusing on restoring the essentiality, the expression, the experience of being African in the ideational space and intellectual atmosphere in which we walk that is not negated, is not a nullifying experience.
And I come back to the language issue. I'm suggesting that a lot of us, many uh, uh, young folk who are going through clinical training are being taught to kiss the ring of DSM and love all their thoughts and stuff. But I'm suggesting we might want to take a moment to think about if there is a, an African no nosology that, that is counter to, or not even counter to, but that is our uh, 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 diagnostic nosological classificatory system. And I've just begun to play around with things that we've already know. In black psychology, we got Akbar's personality, Cambone's cultural, uh, Dr. Myers's suboptimality theory, Phillips new into, uh, I've talked about traumatization of disconnected spirit, the zebos. We got stuff in the AB side that we've been working through struggling, almost like being on an old fashioned scrub board. The old scrub board you're putting about and you scrub and scrub and scrub trying to get it, understanding it. And then there's an African nose algae that's, emer that's emerging in my work. And there's some things like withdrawal of ancestral protection. We never think about that, uh, Being uh, acting without spirit, act of spiritual, without this spiritual connection, spirit de de defilement, uh, heart being unsettled. These are, these, are, these are terms that I've gotten from talking with Baba Laos and, and Sangomas and, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and Shaman about what is the functioning that is dysfunctioning for our people. So we just lay those out. And then I'm suggesting that there's a, maybe that we can begin to embrace and I, I would not suggest you do this in your graduate work because unless you have uh, uh, Lyndon James Myers as your professor and can understand that, don't take this to no one else because you're you going to get deep, deep, deep problem. But this is this is what I want to leave, leave you as a footprint to go to after you get off that out of that place you were in. But then we can begin to create an African a healing terminology. Like Lyndon mentioned, in, in Golo, energy of self-healing. I'm suggesting that we use uh, Buana or Mbwana Mboti the child of our ancestors to talk about that being our client, our patient. If I have, if I'm sitting across the room with the child of my ancestors, that's a different relational energy than if I'm talking about, I'm sitting across a court appointed person that has come, has made to come to see me and that's my client or that's my patient or that's my subject. See those terms are used in their, in their frame are not good for us. The Nganga, Nganga, one who's capable of activating the process by which the body repairs, cures and restores itself. Hmm, we should be we should be creating in gangas and not in quote therapists. That's me. Don't ask me if you don't if you don't say that. Lafia need a state, a condition, a state of perfect and total peace. How do we do that? How do we help young people, young mothers who come home from the hospital with their new baby be motivated by the idea of creating in their household a state of perfect and total peace? Because that's where the baby, the new infant thrives. Zola, we are Zola money right now. Love activates and goal. So all this we can go through and we can begin to take these and, and explore them. Look at them, see how this is going to help us heal the African mind. And then I want to suggest a couple of things. Uh, uh, this uh, notion of the Moko Jumbi. Moko Jumbi was a stilt walker. You see them on the right side, left side of the page, stilt walkers. Stilt walkers have been hijacked and made to be uh, artifacts for entertainment. You go to a festival, you go to a carnival, and some guys come out, some girls, boys go walking on stilts. Everybody gets amazed about how they can balance themselves to these big, long poles, long poles. But the Moko Jumbi really were, were, were spirit beings. They were always, they always had a white ash mask on, held up high. And I'm rescuing this notion of Moko Jumbi and say Moko Jumbi really were raised up high on stilts so that they could do two things. They can help us decolonize the African mind and help us to affirm African being. So now I'm, I'm, I'm playing now, playing like you do in Capoeira. I'm playing with this idea of this energy. If one leg of the Moko Jumbi is to decolonize the African mind, then the task is to, ref is to free our minds by scaffolding ideas that have to be dealt with, like dismantling the edifice of white hegemony, deconstructing the implicit privilege we give to white thought, disrobe the false image of white aesthetic, challenge and correct the singularity of a material ontology. See, that's the left leg, if you will, the, of the Moko Jumbi. Remember the Moko Jumbi is raised up high, to, so, up high so it can see uh, evil coming, see an enemy coming, and it's raised up high so it can see what far reaching medicine needs to be got. So I'm now taking that, taking that idea of the Moko Jumbi and say the left leg is a leg that raises up to decolonize the African mind, doing at least those five things, dismantle, deconstruct, disrobe, challenge, and, and engage. 
and all those things we're suffering with. Look at them. Institutional pressure, place, nigga, know your place, classism, disenfranchisement, finance, thingification, Bobby Wright's menticide, aristocracy, all genetic inferiority, chattel enslavement, individualism, apostolic authority, all these things are ideations that cripple us from understanding. So we have to, we have to decolonize our mind from being holding those. The second leg of the Moko Jumbi, and here's where I think we come to talk about renewing the African mind with ancestral consciousness. Remember, remember what I talked about, what is ancestral consciousness? Well, the other, next leg, the other leg, the right leg, is to affirm African beingness. In order to reclaim an African being, to reclaim, restore the African mind, we must accept a fundamentally different meaning of being human and continually address the following tasks. These are critical, these are essential. Understand being spirit, being dim. I use the word dim, dim people, dim kids, dim folk, dim, divine energy made manifest. Understand being spirit, being able to engage in both visible and invisible realms of reality. They made our invisible realm, the spooky stuff, the scary stuff, the go place with ghost style. Honor, this is the critical one, honor the feminine as primary and paramount. That's different from gender equity. That's different. I'm saying to you, it's different from gender equity. We ain't trying to make men and women the same. It is, in fact, the feminine is primary and paramount. I should say that three times. Put it in your head. The feminine is primary and paramount. That doesn't make me less. I'm massive. It don't make me less. It makes me wise and understanding. The feminine is primary and paramount. See, these things are essential for renewing the African mind enhance the understanding of the sacred meaning of being human. We are sacred. We are sacred. Enhance the and sacred meaning of being human. Advance all human potential and unlimited possibility. We should not go, shouldn't be in school being afraid to go to algebra class, but someone told us that mathematics doesn't belong to us. We should advance human possibility, human potential, unlimited, poss unlimited possibility. Provide opportunity. This is where we get creative. Provide opportunities for competence, conscious, and confidence building. How do we create rituals, parties, dances, or ceremonies that do that? Support intentionally cultural maturation and spiritual evolution. So th these go going on, on, but I want to move to the point of this nosology. Think about, think about this. We have this diagnostic statistical manual that we've all been taught we have to be obedient to. Well, I want to propose that we can have an African symbiotic illumination manual. I'm calling that the ASIM, a African symbiotic, symbiotic illumination manual that allows us to look at the fact that there's some culturally imposed diagnostics like the depression. All these on the, the right side to need to be interrogated. What really are they? Depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, somatization, cultural dysthymia, post-traumatic stress syndrome, all those things. But then we can begin to think about if we have some culturally congruent symbiotic illumination because it was Saku is the illumination illumination manual, then what is these things that we, we're learning from our own experience? Starting with just what AB Science created, Akbar, Campbell, Myers, a whole bunch of folk. Uh, then look at these new things that I'm, I'm rescuing out of African deep thought, Kazungu Zongo, Nsumu, Sumuno, uh, things that are called uh, tornadoes of the mind. How do we then address those issues? And so <laughs> let me suggest, and then I'll stop with this, we, have, we can engage in conversation, that, there's, that we can begin to talk about the culturally congruent mapping of our spiritness, trying to uncover our inner strength in Golo, trying to look, understand our cultural traditions and alignment. And we can, we can, we can interrogate ourselves in our, 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 our families, our people, and, and quote our uh, 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 Moana and Bolte, the children of our ancestors. And ask the question, have you ever looked for something and found something else? Just experience. I was looking for something, I found something else, and something else I found was exactly what I needed. Or go to the library looking for a book, and what, you find this other book, open that book, and there's exactly what you needed. There's something going on here. Self-healing potential. Are there particular customs, traditions in your family that are passed down from generation to generation? Pick those up. Don't throw them aside and say this old-timey stuff. Look at those, interrogate those, understand what the cultural alignment was. Upbringing. How were you raised? Uh, not necessarily how you were raised, because maybe it was too late for you and I, but we could ask, how was your grandmama raised? How was your great-grandmama raised? What sayings and proverbs did you hear in your family that were used to 
where you're growing up? Do you have chores to do? What was the what was the learning out of those chores? You know, a, a quick example. My father would my father would be sitting by his chair and he would call down the, down the backyard and say, "Wait, wait, Brad, you come up here." And we'd run upstairs, and my father would say, "Go over there and give me a glass of water." We said, "This lazy, this lazy old man. He could he's two feet from the water. He had to run up three flights of stairs to get him a glass of water." But what the lesson on that chore was, was that we have to, we have to bow down to the importance of eldership. We have to, in quote, sacrifice for other. So you have to, we have to unpack our upbringing and what we were done and what they really, what the deep meaning was behind that. Uh, what sayings and words were used to determine respect and honor? And then looking at life models. Let's, let's look at those. We, we always... During Black History Month, we pull up Malcolm, we pull up Martin, we pull up uh, Sojourner, we pull up all these folk as life models. But I want to, I want us to interrogate what are the stories about your family, your own personal family that make you proud? What fight, what success, what achievements are the particular challenges and obstacles that we face? We do it well, right now. We're in the biggest obstacle we face right now in terms of this 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 lockdown called sheltering in place because of COVID. 19, but I want us to think about with the, with the masses of the mind, we're going to think more deeply than regular. Who do you see as your hero and heroine and why? It's a conversation, and, uh, but it'd be a deep conversation. And then family stories. How have you experienced love in your family? Sometimes our families have been hurt, and all, all I can think about is my family is, is, is painful. But even in that pain, if you, if you interrogate deep enough, you'll find moments of light, moments of love in those families, those you lift up. What are the tales of family? And then personal passion, sometimes I call excitement. Have you experienced uh, the presence of relatives or friends that are recently departed? We were taught that that's a ghost, that's a hey, be, be afraid. No, that's a messenger. How have the dead relatives ever come to you in a dream and what was the message they were sending? What are the events in your life that you think have impacted your family almost irreparable? Unpack those. And this is just my attempt to try to talk about a way to, to renew the African mind with strategies. Renewing the African mind with African, African ancestral consciousness for me is to talk about them, divine energy made manifest, rescuing them, rescue them people, rescue them people, rescue the divine energy that makes them people. And there are things that we now know philosophically that are critical, like human imperatives, things that have to be done, and that to be them, a moral mandate, to be more better them, and social requisites, requisites, to be we and not me, to be we as them. These are just quickly, and I, I went real fast here, but I want to throw out some stuff so we can we can talk about a, a common set of ideas that we look at. That's them. Family, that's the that's the the, the, what the the first responder is your family. And if your family's been shattered and fractured and, and been dysfunctional, the first task is to heal itself. Know thyself, heal ourselves by gathering your family together and figuring out how to make that family whole and well. I'll start with that, uh, Linda, and ask you to <laughs> help me now. Rescue me where I was lost, correct me where I was wrong, help me go through all of this. Well, yep. thank you, Baba Wade. I, I couldn't stop you. It was just going too good. And I know people need this information. But one of the things that, that occurs to me when you talk about the uh, nosology and you talk about uh, suboptimality, suboptimality is exactly what you describe when you talk about the fractured yes. consciousness. So suboptimality is an analysis of how we've been indoctrinated and suffered from menticide, epistemicide, and how we have to leave that to move yes. to optimality, which yes. is the realization of who we really are as divine beings expressing. And uh, then the process, the methodologies are many from my um, research and what the ancestors had given me is um, that premise, self-knowledge is the basis of all knowledge. I think all that you said is absolutely true, but if you don't know yourself, it's going to be very hard to negotiate and meander through all that information you just shared with us without first getting in touch with your own identity and love. Self-love is the basis of all love because the self you're loving is that divine infinite self. 
that multidimensional self that includes the ancestors, the yet unborn, all of nature, the entire community. So that multidimensionality of self and the self love that emerges from that is what's going to set you on the way. And that's what's going to allow you. Um, we were talking about the principle of Zola and Angola. When I love me, I'm going to love you. Yeah. And but the, the important here to be careful, there's, there's, a, there's a slippery default mechanism here because when we use the language of self, we think about just me, Wade Noble self. But the self is the all, is all of us. Mm -hmm. So I can't love Wade Nobles and not love all African people. And that's why I say it's multidimensional self. Yes. With yes. the big ass, the but you have to remind folk that Linda, you have to remind folk that all the time because we've been taught over and over again, self is individuality, and we have to remind it every time we every time we say for me every time I say self, I have to remind me it's an extended self, it's a continuous Absolutely. self. You have yeah, to the false yourself. self, the little self, the individual you is the one we've been brainwashed into and the one we're trying to get rid of and overcome so we can come into full knowledge of our true self. So. Um, that's very exciting because we have in place an analysis and uh, healing methodologies to help people make that shift from that fractured yes. consciousness to that whole healthful, inclusive consciousness of divine spirit. And that's what allowed us as African people to survive 400 years of brutality unknown before in the history of humankind. And that's what's going to lead us forward. But now we need to make sure that that disruption imposed by formal education and other institutional structures to deny us access to the truth of our ancestral heritage and who we are is pushed aside. And we're creating space now in ABCI and uh, I'm sure everybody who's really committed to the liberation of the African mind and the illumination of the African soul is fully engaged in creating spaces so that we can learn and we can unlearn and overcome uh, the epistemicide and the menticide. And so, yay! And I think we <laughs> Thank have you to so see, much, our, we see ourselves, uh, see this, this thing we're calling Black psychology as the science, and every science has a technology. The technology of those healing modalities, those therapeutic visions that we create. And if we don't we, if we don't consciously hold on to the power of languaging, then we end up taking that same suboptimality and put a black face on it and say we we didn't solve something. We don't make we don't take this suboptimality and make it black. And I'll say that's what happened in terms of African governance and on the continent. That the leadership took over the ran the Europeans out and then became black Europeans in the rulership of their countries. And now they get all all crazy there. So we have to always be very clear that we have a technical language, a technical language. That's what I'm trying to contribute to our minds, a technical language that we use that technical language to create behavior, create reinforced attitude, beliefs, uh, begin to talk about uh, diagno diagnosis. What's what, what is that what's wrong with you is what has happened to you. And then what has happened to you is your is it can be corrected by you doing a different happening. We got to do a different happening. And there's such a power in languaging, as you say. For a long time, we've talked about black psychology. Many of us have met uh, racial uh, designation. Black is for me. Black psychology is the absorption of all the energies, all the colors of the spectrum into one. It's that sourcing. It's uh, founded in that. Um, oneness with the creative life force. So it's very imperative that we take our language back. And if we can't use the African terms yet, infuse the meaning, the consciousness of that African yeah, mind uh, set to to uh, move us forward. Let's see who has a thought they want to share. Oh, Jojo has to leave soon. <laughs> Let's let her share. No, I say I'm not even going to leave like <laughs> I was gonna have to be late. This is so good. I think Baba Nobles, all the information that you shared and was um, already discussed, like with Nana Linda. 
I feel like it was just so much useful information, especially for me. I'm I'm writing my dissertation on racial trauma. So I'm like, I feel like I just ate a book. Like it was like the crash course on like, <laughs> on like how can we like fix this crazy stuff going on? And I think that um, over the weekend, I saw a really profound article that Dr. Neville shared on her Twitter. It was like, I'm tired of talking about black trauma. Like let's talk about this rage. Let's talk about how we're going to fuel this to, you know, get us to where we need to be in black liberation because these people can't keep messing with us. So like, that helped me kind of, um, I guess, feel a lot better over the weekend because I've been feeling really sad about everything going on. And I've been feeling guilty about finding like moments of joy in between all the trauma. And it's like, why should I have to, why? That's not like our story. Like our story is not meant to be trauma, trauma, trauma. Like we were super divine and successful before that. So um, yesterday when I was around some black folk, it was just, it just felt really good. Um, me and G had a cookout with some of our other friends and it was just really good to be around black people being happy and not, you know, having that attached to, you know, everything going on outside, even though, of course, we need to have time to mourn and stuff. But yeah, super great, super great information. Um, I'm sorry to my client, but I'm gonna have to. <laughs> Anyone else? Going once? <laughs> uh, I could happen like really, really quick. And I, I think one of the things that uh, is, is frustrating for me is when we sit here and we see like how beautiful articulated and, and, and outlined and mapped this entire theory is. And there are a lot of people who are in the current phase of, everybody's in a different phase of journey, right? They, they hear the languaging, they, they hear the progress, they hear, they hear this and an immediate shield will go up, right? I, I've talked to people who immediate shield will go up who say like, well, we have all these biological genetic studies about these things, there had to be some realness to it, or people saying uh, there are aspects of, of European culture or American culture, I'm not fully African. Like a lot of people hear this and in their current stage of their journey right now, they, um, an immediate shield goes up, a roadblock goes up to embracing um, the knowledge. And the only thing I want to share, I guess, is I think a lot of what's been discussed became particularly salient for me um, do, doing a lot of clinical work, right? Where a lot of people will say like all these disorders, there's so much research on them, they're so real. And then when you're actually like, whether you're in, in a prison or, or a forensic setting or a hospital, you see that's not how these things are getting applied. Like it's based on which cultural values seem to be real in, in a very bare sense, right? When, when a black person comes and talks about I, I feel spirit, I, 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 talk to, I talk to ancestors, I, I do these things, I feel connected to other people. That could be immediately branded and often is immediately branded. <laughs> it's schizophrenic. Delusion, right? And that's how a lot of these things are applied. So when people say this, uh, and unfortunately I've come into a lot of contact, when people say a lot of this stuff seems outlandish, you just have to really take a look at your clinical work and see like, no, this is how it's always been and how it has been. And so the, the work that's being done, the, the, out, the outline that's been shared is, is such a necessary one. So um, no, I, that's just, I, I just really appreciate what, what's been uh, shared so far. You yeah. know, I, I, when I used to, uh, I don't want to use the word tolerate, but when I used to uh, engage in those kinds of conversations with colleagues, I would uh, end up realizing that the only question I can leave them with is, does that work for you? <laughs> Because if you if you if you put a mat, you you're putting a shield up a wall against what I'm saying, let's go past my wall to your wall inside your wall and ask you, uh, is that working for you? Uh, uh, what's 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 your success rate <laughs> in, in in healing black folk using what you use? And it seems to me that if you have, you don't have no overwhelming success rate, you might, as an intelligent human being, decide to take another look. And leave it alone. I, I can't. I can't convince you, but I could I, at least ask you. Look at your own performance. Mm -hmm. Look at your. If you if you were if you were a uh, a a, 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 a worker in a factory, and you and the goal was to turn out fifty thousand cans of soup a week, and you looked at your rate and you only got one can coming out that week, you might want to ask whether that your performance is effective or not. And I think using the Western now, I understand those of y'all in graduate school, you got to play this little game. I say, and I say it's a political game. You got to get out. You got to get out. Unless you have some professors that are in your corner at your university that can work with you, 
then you got to get your goal is to get out, not to debate these professors, to get out. And then to come home to AB side, come home to black thought and do the real work. That's 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 my suggestion. Whatever, whatever dumb shit they're asking you to do, do it and get out. Don't don't drink the poison, look at the poison. Take the poison across the room to where they want it to go, and then get out. And then come home to AB side, come home to a, to a cohort of black thinkers. And even within black psychology, we got a range of thinkers. We got a range of folk in, in, in the association that engaging in this don't that, oh, that, that, that noble stuff, that 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 Maya stuff, that Kimbo, all that stuff. They're, they're the fringe. We're not the fringe, we the heart. See, but they will make us the fringe element and so we're the heartbeat of the of blackness. But I'm not gonna debate that. I'm not gonna debate, well, I'm the heart, you the fringe. No, 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 no. I'm saying you wherever you are, does it work for you? For me, it, it, it hasn't working. But I look at African wisdom traditions, African thought, and I see I see tools that we can rescue, like I did with the Moko Jumbi. I'm not telling young people, you go do the Moko do, you go do the Moko Jumbi dance. Your job is to do the Moko Jumbi dance. One leg up high, decolonizing your mind. Other leg up high, affirming African being. So do put some rhythm to that. Do the Moko Jumbi dance. Do the Moko Jumbi. That's how we. That's how we restore the African mind by cleaning you know it up. That? Go ahead. That's what I call the optimization process. It's the Moko Jumbi dance. Absolutely. That is coming to the realization of who you really are in that higher consciousness and realizing you're in a social context of lower consciousness. And how do you make that shift? And one thing I think in response to your query, um, Evan, is um, as Wade pointed out, how's it working for you? It's not working. <laughs> Our health statistics demonstrate we're not well, and we're getting worse the longer we're going along with the acculturation assimilation. But we have psychotherapeutic strategies and approaches and methodologies that do work, that have been demonstrated to work with black people over a quarter of a century. It's been verified. They like what they call a, a evidence-based. <laughs> well, if that's what they need, we have the evidence-based outcomes that we can point to and see um, how it's how it's working for black people in in need. Yeah, I just wanted to just hop in. You know what uh, Evan mentioned was really was really important. Everything that Baba Noble talked about was you know just just keep my it's mind blowing. And I just want to just like add on to like what Evan was saying. You know, and um, something I realized, and this is going back to um, Dr. White, and he was talking about uh, the idea of you know, healthy paranoia in Black people, you know, and that's rooted in, like, uh, cultural mistrust, uh, you know, with white people and just that, with society. And I feel like sometimes that's labeled as, you know, um, it could be labeled as a diagnostic term for the DSM as, like, you know, being paranoid and things like that. But as a Black person, having paranoia, healthy paranoia is uh, similar to being hypervigilant, just knowing how to navigate you know, the world in this country, especially with everything that's going on right now. So having that um, that cultural aspect of how you treat your clients um, can definitely help with their healing, you know, because as a Black person, you can understand and, you know, even empathize with everything that's going on. And you can approach the treatment differently if somebody explains that versus a Eurocentric or Westernized clinician who's not as um, culturally adaptive may look at that kind of statement and navigate a whole different way. So I think it's really important. And also, you know, having um, that, trying to uh, debunk and uh, lower, you know, as much cultural misorientation that that's around in, uh, in our people, because I think it's so important, especially because of like how we can interpret things, how we can see something without even have to explain it. You know, I, I love the phrase like what's understood doesn't have to be explained and just having that understanding of as black people as people within our culture is important when it comes uh when it comes to treatment we become nganga healers uh elder harvey thoughts for me the you know the path to healing is always about um you know they say all knowledge is self-knowledge and the path to healing is about discovering yourself and discovering yourself is discovering your culture and what Baba Wade has said about, you know, the self being, when we think about the self, we're not thinking about the individual self, 
we're thinking about um, the really the universal self. Uh, you know, when we we have this saying, and I work with an organization uh, locally called the Cultural Wellness Center, and you know, one of our the paradigms in the Cultural Wellness Center is that. Uh, individualism and loss of culture is what makes people sick. And so what we focus on in trying to help people heal and get well is we just focus on connecting them, connecting them to other people of their, of their culture and, and connecting them to their cultural history uh, and helping them to understand that, you know, what like what Beba, Beba Wade was saying, like, I can't think of myself without think of, of the connection that I have with Evan and Garrick and Jojo, you know. I mean, it's like, I, am, I, I have to learn to see myself as connected to what we uh, heretofore thought of as the other. Once you begin to do that, it's a matter of, you know, yes. developing the, the consciousness that there is no other. It's just, you know, we are one being. That's you know the one of the concepts that Baba Wade had in his large, complicated diagram was the concept of consubstantiality, and consubstantiality means that we all come from one substance, and we all are one substance, and part of our healing is becoming is is re recapturing the consciousness that we are one substance. This is so wonderful that we that, 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 that I, I'm trying to train myself always to deal with language and even a regular conversation. Brother, you said in, in, in ways complicated, I mean, uh, yeah, you said complicated. <laughs> Looks uh, complicated. But no, 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 let me watch this. Is it complicated or is it elegant? It's elegant. <laughs> if it's complicated, <laughs> if it's complicated, it connotes possibly confusing. If it is elegant, it connotes possibly beautiful. <laughs> you, you see, I, I want us to play with language. Thing. Language is, is not, it, it's nuanced, but, but I think that like, it's very like, important. Like most things in the universe, both of those possibilities exist. It is possibly elegant and it is possibly beautiful. And it is possibly, it can be seen as complicated by someone who doesn't see the connecting thread there that sees the unity in it. And, it and that's the conversation we should be having on that. Complicated. Yes. And that's, that's the conversation the universe we have on everything. looks like that to us. The universe looks diverse and complicated, but the universe is really all connected. And beautiful. And beautiful. And so that, you see, that's, and the conversation, that's the conversation that wants to have because as we even talk about this about the individual and self, having a relationship with other folk, that's one step, but it's also having a relationship with those folk that are in the invisible realm. Mm -hmm. We start talking about having a relationship. They're myself. They're, they're myself too. Right. And so, so we, that, so, we, so we that's are our becomes, ancestors. We are the manifestation absolutely, absolutely. of our ancestors, and we are our future generations. <laughs> absolutely. And so that's oh, so I that's got into myself. I love it. And those Robina, are the, we're almost out of time. Did you have a thought, Robina? Yeah, I do. I did have a thought and a question. Um, uh, my thought just more so expands on what you all have said about the, you know, wall or the shield that folks might put up when they hear the languaging that we use around Black psychology or um, the cultural explanations for how we are the way that we are, how we respond to things. And I think it's interesting that folks who, you know, are quote unquote, aiming to be culturally competent end up kind of having that shield that they put up. And then I, I agree with what you were saying, Nana Linda, like while folks are catching up to the languaging, I think it's important for us to still embody Concepts. what those definitions of those things are, because um, if we're not doing that, then it's like, we're gonna continue to like live in this cycle of them never understanding. And not that we're doing it for them to understand, but because we're coexisting in life with them, there has to be some sort of harmony that we strive um, towards. And then my question has to do with, um, I don't even really know how to ask it, but I know that there are some folks who even, you know, living now, they may not be necessarily striving towards Black liberation or living um, in, I, I don't even know how to describe it, but 
now who are or people who are ancestors or they've passed which ancestors are we to like call on or listen to like how do you know how to differentiate the ones that are like I don't know how to finish asking the question but does that make sense yes. like there are some folks who are not really ones that maybe we should honor or listen to or carry on their legacy because it wasn't um it wasn't for us necessarily, even though they're black people or African people. But I think you, you hit upon the key point. The key point there is differentiation. How do we learn to look at knowledge and differentiate what is useful for us uh, from what is harmful to us? And you know, in some sense, it's all good, uh, but we have to be able to parcel out uh, uh, the helpful elements from the unhelpful elements, as opposed to, you know, trying to categorize things that things are people or are concept as good or bad as, you know, we have to be able to look at, you know, it's all, there's, there's a possible goodness in all of it. Just like, you know, by the way, and I were going back and forth about, is it elegant or is it complicated? Well, both those things can be present. Right. And we have to be able to discern the goodness in what we're looking at. Baba Wade, you have to sp speak to this because it's a common question people have about ancestors. Well, I, I can only speak to what I was uh, exposed to in, in initiation. And that is that, the, that you know, when, when, when I was struggling with, uh, if, I'm, if I'm seeking a way to communicate with the ancestors, with the, with the dwellers of heaven, and I look at myself, I can intellectually say, and I don't have to. I know the fact that that my great grandmother was very light skinned and she was that because because her mother was raped by a, a white slave owner, and we have that story. Well, is that white slave owner my ancestor? Because because in some sense, I'm that's part of the bloodline that I'm that, that comes out to me having a certain tone in my pigmentation. What I was taught in initiation is that that right conduct is so important. Right conduct is so important is that when you do evil, when you do wrong, when you do harm, you disqualify yourself from becoming an ancestor. So all those evil doers that may be biologically in my bloodline are not my ancestors because they disqualified themselves. You follow that? There's the the yeah, logic there is that you have to do good, otherwise you will not become an ancestor. And becoming an ancestor is that is that holy place, is that great place. And so, so, so you have to recognize that when I when I go to my altar, in my home, and I pray to the invisible one, ones, well, whoever his name was that raped my great great grandmother ain't on the list, and I'm comfortable with that. You by logic, oh, say, oh no, no, what nobles. We can show DNA that you have 20% Irish in you. No, 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 no. If the Irish were good and they shared their potatoes with me, I will speak to them. If the Irish were not good and did evil, they get they disqualified. It's not my throwing them up. It's not my kicking them off the island. They disqualified themselves by their wrongdoing. So I so I don't have a, I don't have a need to try to figure out who's the good ones, who's the bad ones. The bad ones ain't in the conversation anymore. I I learn so from the good. I so you're saying the good. That, are you saying that the divine already like makes that happen for us so that we don't have to be discerning like what's happening in the yeah, spirit? Their conduct made that happen for us. Okay. Their conduct, because the, 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 the divine law is to do good, mm -hmm. to bring beauty to the earth. And when you violate that, you violate your ownership of being an ancestor. That's what I was taught. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that, that resonates so well for me. I don't have to, I don't have to debate that anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm very, I'm, it, it just, it sits right with my soul. So I don't have to debate no more. I know who my ancestors are. And with all the work I do, all the work I do, everything I share with you as, what, I, what I'm trying to share as a contribution is for me, channel through them. Because I think we, I think we who call ourselves scholars and intellectuals are simply portals that the ancestral insight is being shadowed through us. I'm not genius, I'm not smart, I'm a portal. 
Now, if I keep, if I clean my portal really well, because I can't have a little dirty, dirty portal. If I clean my portal really well, then the ideas come through uninhibited. And that's what you all are. You are all, not just me, all of us are portals. But we have to work on ourselves. And I, where I, said, I go back to, you know, we look at the people put up barriers, but we make self-imposed barriers our own selves. We, so we have, to, we have to interrogate our own self, meaning my personage. My personage, I have to interrogate my own self because my personage, I may put some barriers. I may put some barriers that prevent me from having the greater insight, as well as looking at my family. Let's see, I don't know what you do. You don't work to school with all crazy daughters, Africans, that we ain't no African, all the all internal family conversations we have. I can look at that as well. I can look at the larger craft called psychologists or mental health specialists. That's a craft, that's a guild. We, we got a guild called psychologists uh, craft. I can look at the larger guild and see where there are difficulties in the guild itself. Internal, intra debate, all that we got to work through. Mm -hmm. It's all good. Thank you so much. Yeah. But, man, 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 but you know, I hope, I hope that everyone saw that when Harvey and I were talking about complicated versus elegant, the reason why we can do that is because we love each other. Mm -hmm. It wasn't it wasn't an attempt to say, oh, Harvey, you stupid, you wrong. It ain't it ain't complicated. It's elegant. Don't be so stupid. <laughs> no, we were talking in a way that said, let's clarify. And you only can clarify if you love each other. Mm -hmm. That's we don't yeah. we, we shouldn't we I don't think I think at least the folk and black psychology that I even bother to talk to about, we don't have debates. We have discussions because we love each other. We, we very much, each other. We very much need to interrogate our ideas. We've gotten into, uh, it's easy for us to interrogate other people's ideas, but you know the way we interrogate our own ideas is to put ourselves in these discussions and debate these ideas and, and no, not, and only, out of not time. only challenge the people we respect, but have them challenge us. Absolutely. We are Matthew out of time. Matthew. This has been a wonderful conversation. Hold on, hold on. We were talking in the chat about going about 10 to 15 minutes over. Oh, started. nice. Yeah. Yeah. We have that latitude. Wonderful, wonderful. And, and, and the, Let's do good, it. This, that I can say quickly, the source of our debate, our discussion is Zola, is love. Zola. The source of our discussion, the source of our debate has to be Zola, has to be love because because we activate our own clarification in dialogue with each other. That's what Zola is about. That's Absolutely. why it's so important to rescue our own thought. And, and that's why it. we're so excited having you here this month because what we try to do here is to demonstrate Zola. We disagree sometimes, but that's our growth, isn't it? That's, that's our right. development. And it, and it makes us love one another even more when barriers aren't put up. So. Yay. I want to pose a question or a comment from the audience, since we're talking about challenging our thoughts. Um, somebody, somebody in the audience said to say all white people were racist at any time in history is a fallacy. So what, what do our elders say to that? Who said all I white people? I can were. quickly say in history, all white people weren't white. <laughs> That's. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what point in history There's you talking the about? There's the answer to that. <laughs> yes, what point in history you talking about? So, what, so if we understand racism to be a system of assigning value and allocating opportunity based on skin color, not all white people maybe have been at a level high enough to implement that social policy and those practices, but they all benefit. And so I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about who's racist and who's not, but get back to the point that we made relative to ancestors. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. Are you doing good? Are you, are you, you doing, doing good? Ma? Are you helping bring justice to the world? Uh, we're trying to rest in heaven here. We're trying to become one with the divine infinite. And is your behavior going to get you there? Are your thoughts going to get you there? Is that energy you're exuding going to get you there? And then you self-select in or out. We had, I think we had a discussion a few weeks ago about how um, uh, African people who are not from uh, America uh, sometimes will point out that Africans in America are so focused on white people, uh, uh, more so than you know, uh, our brothers and sisters in the diaspora are. You know, the question is like, why is that question even being asked? You know? <laughs> Uh, because we know that, you know, uh, those people who think of themselves as white right now uh, are descendants of 
African people, you know, eons ago. And so what happened to them? So we get so caught up in this, uh, this you know, us versus them thing that we forget about the consubstantiality. We forget about the fact that we all come from one substance. Uh, what we need to do is to figure out uh, what has happened in the world that's caused the kinds of changes and dynamics that have come about. Suboptimality. <laughs> so I absolutely agree with you. And I think the reality is when we aspire to that African mind with ancestral consciousness and we move in that way, it won't occur to us to ask that kind of question. Rather, the question will be, how can I, given who I really am, <laughs> uh, move toward the realization of that identity that we've just been discussing for the last hour? Are there other questions in the chat or online have, that we should be addressing? I have one question as we maybe pull uh, some more stuff from the chat. Um, one of the things I was curious about, and it relates to uh, Robina's question uh, somewhat previously about ancestors, is there there's like a large body, I think, of, uh, of, of critical revolutionary Black thought that seriously and intentionally distances itself from understanding ourselves as spirit and spiritness. Right, you could go back to Fanon, who was in Distance some ways very itself critical. from understanding our, ourselves as spirit? Yeah, yes. Oh, yeah. So I would say like, again, Fanon, for instance, was critical of African religions, traditional religions. Uh, he, he, did, he thought they were representative somewhat of a, a lack of progress in thinking in some of his writings. You have uh, William, William Cross, for instance, he's very intentionally not, he, uh, I had those conversations with him who, he, he doesn't understand uh, people as spirit. He, he doesn't, uh, I believe he was a very intentional atheist. And right now you have Frank Wilderson out in California whose, whose Afro-pessimist theory is also uh, you know, very popular. And he's also very intentional about not understanding, again, ourselves as spirit, uh, inter interrogating our, yeah, our religion. See, I and see. so I, I'm just curious, as it, uh, th there are people, right, who might have arrived at that thought process, right? Distancing ourselves from that. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't necessarily, or maybe this is what I'm curious about. Do we understand those still critical revolutionary thinkers as, I guess we all have levels of fractured consciousness. I'm just curious about how we interrogate, how we have conversations in Zola, right, mm -hmm. with people who arrive at a very radically different place mm -hmm. in their Black revolutionary thought. Can, can, may, may I ask two things real quickly? One is that, yep. uh, ask the question, if you are, if you are, if you cooking yourself a revolutionary, have you won the revolution with what you got? If you ain't won the revolution with the, what you got, then maybe you need to rethink what you got. Second thing is that people, and I, I consider Fanon as a hero of mine. I, I, I consider myself as a student. I even taught courses on Fanon. Fanon was talking about religion, about spirituality, which is different from being spirit. Mm -hmm. He wasn't, he, he, he never approached the question of we as human beings, our spirit beings. He approached the question of that, uh, that the Christianization of us was a trap. It prevented us. We had to. We have to imagine a new man. Set foot. He's used the language. We need to set on the earth. Set a foot. A new new man. The new man in my interpretation for now was him groping towards creeping up on the idea that the new human is a spirit being and not a human being. He didn't get there. He didn't get there. That's yeah, what I was the, interested about. I was. I was interested about the ways. And this is helpful to hear you hear, hear you say it. That. Having read some of Fanon's writings on spirituality, I almost think that if you were to sit, if we were to have that ancestral conversation, right, in that realm, which hopefully one day, you know, we'll all be in conversation like that, it'll be a beautiful thing, that maybe he might take it in a different way. And I'm curious about how you would react and respond to those areas where there might be that very severe, right, departure. You see, I, so he I, says I, he gets it now. I, I don't <laughs> think there'd be a disagreement. Because I, I think that's funny. That I say that's funny. there's a distinction <laughs> between spirit and spiritualism. And, and I think that that's what Baba Way was pointing out, is that we have, we have come to think of spiritualism from what we were taught in the Christian church. That's right. And it, it's not the same thing that we're talking about when we talk about that, that uh, 
amorphous spirit that imbues all things in the universe. I, I, consider, I, Fanon, I consider Fanon a genius. He was dealing with the domains of inquiry for him were his, psycho his psychiatry time. in the realm of Christianity and Islam. He didn't get to the qu question of quantum physics. He didn't get the question of energy, of spirit. He, and he, I think he, if he hadn't died early, he would have got there. And in fact, we may, you, be, he gets it now. we may yeah. be, remember I said that we are, we are our ancestors come to complete what was incomplete. We, I may be completing the incomplete of Fanon. Mm -hmm. And I think the reality is too, I can only communicate with Fanon in the spirit realm, but he may mm -hmm. be back in body and you may be him. I don't know, Evan, but <laughs> in actuality, we've talked to, um, uh cross and we've talked i've talked to frank yeah. about mm -hmm. this and they don't they don't have a clue because yeah. the, what i'm bringing is not what they're talking about but when you explain to them what you're talking about mm -hmm. a glimmer comes but a, not enough to make them be able to carry it forward and okay. develop that's the piece i was curious about and so maybe i was uh incorrect in how i was characterizing for Noel's incomplete projects but those people again, like like your cross, like your Wilderson, who again hear it and then don't maybe carry it carry it forward in that way. So and when you talk to them, you can see based on their experiences, exposures, and the meanings they've made, you can understand why they don't quite get it. Yeah. But if you introduce it to them, as Baba Wade has suggested, we're talking about spirit. Mm -hmm. All is spirit. All is energy. We've got the quantum uh, literature now that is being reinforced. What our ancestors said. We have the neuroscientific. So if they're really interested in comprehensive knowledge, then they have to absolutely open the door to a different uh, understanding. And we have to keep in mind that our consciousness has been continually in development. And you know, in earlier stages of consciousness, people were just at a different point. And it's not that their ideas were not helpful, they were helpful. They helped us move the whole thing to, right. ahead. Right. And as we go forward, we are gonna disagree with some of the concepts that we held in the past, even in ourselves, not just in somebody else's writings, but in our own thinking. If we look back over you know, 15, 20 years, we will realize that our consciousness has changed and the way we would have presented it to the world has changed. Being and becoming and going beyond becoming and being. Because so. being is always becoming. Uh, cast to be, doesn't it? Infinite knowledge. So but yeah, keep I think in questions. that context, truth, things that are true have always been true, will always be true. And now we're just expanding and exploring. And um, I just think about my own work. There's a whole nother level out here that I would not speak about at this point because <laughs> mm -hmm. it would be inappropriate. <laughs> but we're always pursuing greater knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Uh, we're are, at 114. How true, many more minutes do we have? <laughs> things that are true have always been true. Our way of conceptualizing those truths has changed over time. Sir. And All we'll is in everything. To. So some people have and some people have. We can't speak for everybody. <laughs> I'll speak for me. Yeah. Mine keeps changing. <laughs> <laughs> I love you all so much. This has been such a wonderful Zola Monday. Uh, next month, we'll be talking even more about dark light consciousness. Oh. <laughs> so we're going to wade deeper into the science of it right. and see how that converges with what our ancestors said in the beginning. Thank you oh, so much, Baba Wade. For thank you, Baba Wade, for joining you, thank us. You, thank you for thank inviting you. me. I, I, I enjoyed the stimulation and the Zola that you brought to me. Well, we hope you can come back at some point because we have more to discuss. <laughs> the song is never finished. You're absolutely right. <laughs> and I will try to come back. Just, just keep being informed. Absolutely, we will. Thank you again.